It's not exactly a thing of great beauty, is it? This block of buildings here on the banks of the River Itchen in Southampton. Not exactly the sort of place you'd go to the wall to save, like the cathedrals at Chichester and Canterbury and Winchester and Salisbury. But strange to tell, it's a working place in which a great many people have spent much of their lives. I mean, I first came here when I was in my early 20s, and that's at least a decade ago. And I'm proud of what's poured out of these television studios over the years. And so am I, with good reason. From Studio One here and from the rest of the building, Orson Welles has broadcast. The Beatles and the Rolling Stones, Alec Guinness, John Gilgood and Laurence Olivier, George Best and David Gower, Cliff Mitchell, Margaret Thatcher and Cilla Black and Diana Rigg, Peter Sellers and Gina Lolla Brigida, to name but a few. Fred and I have put in a few hours here too, and so have tens of thousands from across the country and across the south of England. All, or should I say almost all, contributing to the entertainment, the education and the interest of the nation. Well, when ITV first took to the airwaves in the mid-1950s, received opinion at the time was that it was going to be a financial disaster. Who, after all, needed more than one BBC channel? Before long, Roy Thompson, the boss of Scottish television, was brazen-faced enough to call it a licence to print money. But today, half a century down the line, the situation has reversed itself and there are scores of channels jostling for attention. As a result, the money margins grow ever tighter. Dear old Southern Television, started broadcasting from the Plaza Cinema beside the Itchen in Southampton on the 30th of August 1958. Films that had shown there lately included Lucky Jim, Private's Progress, Ice Cold in Alex, and the Hammer House of Horrors, Dracula. Those days are remembered by 68-year-old Gillian Knox, who worked here as an usherette in 1956, and 88-year-old Phyllis West, who sold sweets and chocolates in the 1930s. I worked at the Plaza in 1956. Um, I was engaged to um, a gentleman, and I went to work in the evenings to earn extra money for the wedding and I used to work at Mullard's during the day and I was just serving as normal, uh, you know, the drinks and I didn't even look up, you don't look, you didn't used to look up in those days and this young man came and tapped on my tray and I said to him, you know, what's the matter? And he said, there's a hole in this carton of orange and I, I just sort of looked at him and smiled, I think and he showed me it was all down his trousers, all down his shirt and so I gave him another drink and I didn't think any more of it. Anyway, when I got outside, he was waiting for me and really I suppose it was love at first sight and we've been married 46 years now. I worked there in 1934. I must have gone there before that, but it was 1934 that the manager then was Arthur Fort and his brother at that time was Reginald Fort, the big cinema organist. He was very well known. And his brother heard that I sang at different times and um, he said, would I be af afraid to come on the stage when his brother was there to play in the interludes? It was a special time. And so I said, no, I wouldn't mind at all. So that's when I, I went on the stage and sang, I love you truly. And um, of course, at that time, there weren't pop stars or any singers like there are now. So it was something unusual. So, of course, they printed it in the Echo and took my photograph and it was all in the Echo. And that night, everybody flocked to the place <laughs> to hear me sing. I love you truly, truly, dear. Life with its sorrows, life with its tears. Fades into darkness when I feel you near For I love you truly, truly dear Well done! <laughs> But now the largest cinema in the south of England had been converted into a purveyor of television programmes to the people of the region, who must have wondered what on earth all the fuss was about. Dignitaries arrived for the opening night in their self-important limousines. 
while in what had once been the cinema's auditorium, stars like Gracie Fields, Anne Shelton, Frankie Vaughan, Eunice Stubbs, Diana Dawes, Charlie Drake, and Lionel Blair rehearsed the song and dance routines for a show called Southern Rhapsody, the first of tens of thousands of programs which the company would broadcast in the next 23 years. That old building, unlike today's purpose-built and antiseptic studios, was full of narrow passages, nooks and crannies, and sudden and unexpected views of gilt ceilings and plaster cherubs. It was a romantic and often inconvenient wonderland to work in. It's hard to imagine, isn't it, that these are the very same railings those people were leaning on as they watched Southern's opening night guests arriving in all their pomp. One thing I can promise you is that the traffic over Northern Bridge behind me here is a lot busier now than it was in 1958, and I remember. Now, do you, by any chance, remember this? Well, you'll certainly be over 50 if you do. It's the black and white pictorial sequence in praise of the South Country, with which Southern Television introduced itself to its viewers from the earliest years of its existence. So many memories, so many programmes in those early black and white days, and so little time to cover so much material. Well, to represent the period, we've chosen a section from a film made by one of Southern Television's earliest finds, who was tragically cut off in his prime before he'd made a fraction of the films that he should have presented. Former army officer and expert angler Ollie Kite was a natural broadcaster and a keen-eyed observer of the countryside. He introduced the joys of his talents to thousands of viewers. Armed with just a rod, a line and a lunchbox, fisherman Ollie Kite needed very little to have us all hooked on life in the country. Here he is fishing on Hampshire's River Test and his mesmerising accounts set the trend for countryside commentaries for decades. The first willow leaves are already falling and come sailing down like long ships out of the north. And there's a chill in the early morning and the dew is heavy. It'll be some time yet before there'll be fly on the water and before trout will be rising. Only when the sun has dried the webs do the spiders themselves appear. And then a few flies appear on the water as well. The trout begin to rise and it's time we had a go at them. As soon as I could, I got cracking. I had to be careful because of the tall trees just behind me. They didn't give me a lot of scope. I was just able to reach that fish, but almost immediately he weeded me. Now, it was a good fish and I didn't want to risk breaking. And so, after trying to handline the fish out without success, I decided the only thing to do was to go in and try and persuade him to kick free. Eventually, however, I got the net under him, and there he was, nice and safe. A fish almost identical in size with the first one, about an ounce over the pound. And this may explain to my wife, if she's watching, why it is I come home sometimes soaked to the waist, because I'm afraid both my boots got absolutely filled with cold river water in that simple process. And now, at lunchtime, I was joined by my good friend and doctor, Dr. Dick Jones from Durrington, who often has a day with me to close the trout season. And he brought with him a wonderful hot curry cooked by his wife, Betty, who makes as good a curry as anybody I know this side of Bombay. And with it, many delightful things, coconut, onion salad, mango chutney, and those lovely crunchy Indian poppadums. And to coax this down, for as you well know, we are men of indifferent appetite, some of the doctors 
raspberry wine. And what a beautiful colour this was. Now, this is his secret recipe. Please don't write and ask me for it. I don't know it myself. One for the doctor, one for me, and, of course, one for Ted Channel, the cameraman. Otherwise, we shan't get any work out of him later on this afternoon. Dear old doctor, dear old Ted. And dear old days of black and white television and of the controller of programmes saying you would have to be an absolute word that I do not mention if you could not make a lot of money out of southern television. But sooner or later, alas, it was bound to happen. The old Plaza Cinema was eventually considered to have passed its sell-by date, and this coincided with the transition from black and white to colour television in the late 1960s. Well, soon enough, the demolition men had moved in, and a tidal bay in the Itchen was reclaimed at huge expense to house the stalwart platform on which the new studios would stand. It was a pioneering project, and the men working the pile drivers were astonished when word came daily from the old cinema that they would have to stop for half an hour while a programme was being recorded or transmitted live. The thumps and the judders made the sound men swear and the cameras hop about on the floor. The new studio first began broadcasting in colour on December the 13th, 1969, and one of the early programmes through the building was the ever-popular House Party, with its team of feisty women. The only man ever to appear on the show was called Tom, and he was just eight months old. In the days before the women's lib bandwagon hit the airwaves, it was quite clear that no mere male would have a prayer competing with this team of Wonder Women. It was the start of a new era of daytime television viewing. The ladies of House Party. I remember them all well and with much affection. Well, now for something so very different, I'm really not sure how to make the leap. Anyone recall that distant day when the Saints came marching home in triumph from the FA Cup final at Wembley? Well, I certainly do. And so do the team who ran the Southern Television outside broadcast unit, which was stretched to breaking point. And of all the commentaries I ever did, I think I enjoyed this one the most. <laughs> moment is pretty well here now the Saints are about to arrive at the Civic Center and the waiting for this 30 odd thousand crowd is going to be rewarded this the moment they've been waiting for some of them all day some of these people waiting here since this morning I can now see the coach as it enters the Civic Center in front of it there, the Southampton band. They played at all the home matches for Southampton at the Dell for the past 40 oh, and years. And now, Manami and Osgood the Saints go lead the singing in. when the Saints go oh, marching in. in. Many congratulations. What's it been like? Tremendous. I've never seen anything like it in my life. Frightening it is. I'm still sh I'm shaking more now than I was yesterday. It's such a tremendous turnout. I've never seen anything like it in my life. It's said there are 150,000 people along the route, Mike. Could you believe there were that many? I would have thought there was more. I would have said near 300,000. Oh, unbelievable. It was non-stop from the minute we left. It took us over two and a half hours. Well, Southern Television was rightly proud of its children's programmes, scores of different series over the years. One of the classiest featured John Pertwee and Una Stubbs. It was, of course, that classic Wurzel Gummidge. Impossible to choose the best bit, but here's their wonderfully choreographed and colourful attempt at a wedding. <laughs>
come hither. Are you Wurzel Hedgerow Gummidge? <laughs> That's a funny question, Your Eminence, Mr. Crowmancer. <laughs> you know my name, sir, as soon as I you give it me. Just answer the question, are you Wurzel Hedgerow Gummidge? That I am, sir. And are you Aunt Roll Up, Roll Up, Three Balls a Penny, Sally? I am. And who giveth this Aunt Sally away? Giveth me away? Giveth me away? Oh, I beg pardon, Mr. Crewman, for speaking impertinent, but I'm far too precious to be giveth away. I'd have you know that a fairground gentleman once offered five guineas for me, sight unsound. Aunt Sally, mm -hmm. if you're going to marry Wurzel, someone has to give you away. <laughs> marry Wurzel? <laughs> I'm not going to marry Wurzel. <laughs> oh, yes, she is, Your Honour, sir. Yes. She just says she ain't because she's barmy. Aunt Sally, are you telling me you've changed your mind again? Good heavens, no, Mr. Croman. I have no intention of marrying that dirty old scarecrow in the first place. I'm too grand. The whole idea is for prosperous. Then why, may I ask, have we called all these scarecrows together? So they can admire me in my beautiful wedding dress, and I can have my photos took, and I can appear in all the papers. Oh, well, I did warn you. Well, can't you make her marry me, sir? I mean, I worship the very ground that she stands on, sir. I mean, couldn't you, couldn't you pull her legs off and, and not give them back until after we man and wife? Poor old Wurzel. Well, it, it's out of the question, of course, to do full justice to Southern Television's massive output in a third of a single programme, but no list of the station's many achievements would be complete without a salute to my old mate, Jack Hargreaves, and his wonderful Out of Town. Well, now, good storytellers and broadcasters who can push warmth and friendship through that small glass screen in the corner of your living room are probably born and not taught. Jack, of course, was made for the medium, and here is the old boy in full swing in one of his early black and white films. I'm Jack Hargreaves, and this is my dog, Bess. We live right in the country. Why don't you come and visit us? <laughs> I want you to come with me today and look at a little house in the country where a friend of mine lives. Now, if this house was in London, it would probably be older than any house in the town except perhaps the Tower of London. But in the country, it's one of hundreds of cottages that look exactly like this. So the Thatchers are here today, and they're beginning to pull off the old roof in order to re-thatch it again for what must be probably the 30th or 40th time since the little house was built. And as the thatcher pulls off the old thatch and throws it to the ground, his son is carting it away to be burned. Now, he thinks he's a very modern young man with that long hair. But the interesting thing is that his hairdo is probably exactly the same as the Elizabethan boy who first did this job for his dad when this house was first rethatched all these hundreds of years ago. He's come to the edge now and they pick the best straw for the edge and they work it in very carefully because they're very proud of getting a good edge to the whole roof those are called spiles that he's putting in there with his hammer there's his reed well, that's the comb you see how he beats the thatch in it and it's covered with fine nails like a big square comb and he can use it when he's finished in order to comb all the least loose reed out and make it all look very neat. Now this is just two or three weeks later. And when I came along, the job was nearly finished, except for that last top corner. And look at the difference. See what a beautiful job it is. And see those low windows, which prove that once upon a time, this house didn't have an upper story. He's clipped all the edges, you see, with those sheep shears. And these bits of straw, which are hanging on the creeper, won't hand there long because this is done in springtime and the birds will pinch all those in the next two or three days in order to build their nests. And those starlings are terribly cross because they had a nest in that top corner in the loose thatch last year and they can't think what's happened to their building site. 
It's all changed since the last time they looked at it. And this, believe it or not, was once upon a time the main road between Southampton and Salisbury. That cottage was actually on the main road. And this was the sort of ground over which you had to travel, even between city and city, in the days when this house was first built. Southern Television's final and distinguished drama series in the last gasp of the franchise was the patriotic Winston Churchill, The Wilderness Years, with Eric Porter as Neville Chamberlain and Robert Hardy playing the great man. We join them as the Prime Minister returns from his infamous meeting with Hitler at Munich. Tell you, gentlemen, this is peace in our time. Now, I will begin by saying the most unpopular and unwelcome thing, that we have uh, suffered uh, a total and unmitigated defeat. Right. The utmost that my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, has been able to secure by all his immense exertions at Munich and elsewhere. It ceased! The utmost he has been able to gain for Czechoslovakia is that the German dictator, instead of snatching his victuals from the table, has been content to have them served to him, course by course. For you will find in a matter of months that Czechoslovakia will be engulfed by the Nazi regime, uh, frontier fortresses are already in German hands, uh, something which uh, France and Britain will bitterly regret when Herr Hitler chooses to look westward. Silent, mournful, abandoned, broken, Czechoslovakia recedes into the darkness. That is the most grievous result of what we have left undone for the last five years. Five years of looking for the line of least resistance. Five years of uninterrupted retreat. Five years of neglect of our air defenses. The British people should know that we have suffered a defeat without a war. That we have passed an awful milestone in our history when the whole equilibrium of Western Europe has been deranged, and that these terrible words have been pronounced against the Western democracies, thou art weighed in the balance and found wanting. And don't suppose that this is the end. Well, this is only the beginning of the reckoning. This is only the first sip, the first foretaste of a bitter cup, which will be proffered to us year by year, unless, unless, by a supreme recovery of martial vigor, we arise again and take our stand for freedom. Stirring stuff indeed, and here I am in the newsroom of Meridian, which was the newsroom of TVS, which was, of course, the newsroom before that of Southern Television, and a place where I've spent more hours of my life than I really care to remember, and which will soon be some lucky person's living room overlooking the River Itchen. Well, that's it for Southern Television in this all-too-short hour. Now it's time to turn to TVS and its 10-year reign, and quite a hectic decade it turned out to be. Well, in the year before they took over, in January 1982, the new company was busy making programmes in preparation for its debut. Now, the very first was for a, a new series presented by the ever-youthful Jill Cochran. It was called a full life and eventually chalked up a half century of outside broadcasts. Well, this interview was with that great man of Hampshire, John Arlott, arguably the finest cricket commentator ever. On the 2nd of September, 1980, the whole of the touring Australian cricket team stood and applauded this man, John Arlott, who was retiring after 30 years of cricket commentary. Few people believed cricket would ever be the same again. What they didn't realise was that he became a cricket commentator almost by accident. 
He was in the Southampton Police Force for 11 years, and then in 1945, he joined the BBC as a poetry producer. We invited him back to Winchester College Cricket Ground in Hampshire to talk about his full life. John, welcome back to uh, Hampshire, which you've now left, of course. Does it in any way feel like coming home? Yes, it is, of course, and the only thing I can talk for England, of the life we grew out of, this place, and Winchester College, the buildings, cathedral, and the background tree, every, water meadows. This is Hampshire, this is the essence of England, splendid place. You lived here most of your life before you went to Alderney. Did your family live here before that? Yes, my father's family came from Silchester, and my mother's from the New Forest. My father's from as long as anybody's ever been able to trace. I spent 1945 to 1960 in London, otherwise I spent my entire life in the county. Do you remember your childhood in Hampshire? Was it a happy childhood? Oh yes, it was immensely happy. In retrospect, I suppose we were fairly poor, but I never noticed that. I was never short of food. I was never short of happiness. My parents were quite marvellous, quite marvellous. They, they seemed to understand about the young, they seemed to understand about happiness. You see, if you told me in the 30s, there'd be a time when I was paid for unloading my opinions about cricket on other people, which I used in those days more or less to be shot, I, I could never have believed it. And to be asked to talk about cricket, so I love talking and I love cricket and I love being paid. <laughs> you can't have a much better three in hand than that kind of oh, it was wonderful, glorious, glorious life. Oh, the wonderful John Arlott. Such good times. And now let's change the tempo a bit because we've still got an awful long way to go. So here are just some of the highlights of the TVS programming presented by Fred and Fern Britton on the night that TVS bowed out, December the 31st, 1992. I don't think Fred has aged a bit, has he? Or was he just old for his years then? There is a lot to get through, so let's get cracking. And what better way to begin than with some of the entertainment programmes produced by TVS. Record top bands live off the record. And we had live late night satire in shows like Etc., featuring new comedians like Paul Merton. A lot of people say that the government should do something about Christmas, move it to the middle of the summer, as the Australian government have done, though, when it's <laughs> easier to get taxis and you can buy your presents in the summer sales. No, no, no. I, I think the government should sell Christmas. <laughs> yes, but Christmas takes up 15 days' worth of television. What on earth could replace it? Well, obviously, there's only one thing snooker. <laughs> we also made our own sitcom. That's love. Our figures show that the most popular cover story that girls currently use is, funnily enough, a very old one. The tart standby. <laughs> the tart standby? <laughs> What's that, Belle? <laughs> oh, it was used by every whore in 19th century French literature. I have only had two <laughs> lovers before you, my darling. There was the brute who took away my honour one night when I was drunk, and the young boy who was my first true love. <laughs> and Kelly's Eye with Matthew Kelly, here on a first date. <laughs> it was a dreadful party, wasn't it? <laughs> so many short men. <laughs> <laughs> I can't stand short men. I only go for tall ones. Promising. <laughs> tall, slim men with wavy hair. Very promising. <laughs> uh, what do you do for a living? I'm a nurse. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do? Oh, uh, I'm an actor. Oh. <laughs> Mention going for a lap and I'm dead. <laughs> I wouldn't dream of it. TVS also made a good bunch of films and dramas over the years, some for the cinema and some for the television. Just take a look at the acting talent in these clips. In a fictional future, rules of engagement took us to a south coast town where war clouds were gathering. In hard rock terms, I suspect we're at zero minus three. And zero, for those who remember the exercise, is when the Americans 
went nuclear. The Americans and the Russians have done a deal. No first use on either side. On their respective homelands, that is. They're agreeing that if we have to go nuclear, we go nuclear in Europe. We've just become the killing zone. And no case was too tough for the all-women detective agency, Cat's Eyes. Especially when a friend is shot. You're dirt. You're an animal. A friend of mine is fighting for her life because she took a bullet meant for me. If it takes the rest of my career, I'll get them to slam you back inside and melt down the key. It's not straight thinking to put yourself at risk, but it's something that's not necessary. Tessa, it's necessary for me. At least, let us give you back up. No. If my man sees me go in mob-handed, he'll bottle out. So, your ingenious plan is to walk back in there, confront this professional opposition entirely on your own. Right. And in Murderers Among Us, concentration camp victim turned hunter of Nazi war criminals, Simon Wiesenthal, was played by Ben Kingsley. I keep hearing a figure. It looks like six million. Six million. We must never forget, or it will happen again. Somber and moving material there. Well, in the ten years that TVS held the reins, there were plenty of successes, but like any other broadcaster, not everything always went according to plan. How tough is tough and glass? Well, if you know, I'll show you, this is a piece of tough and glass. I'll show you with this hammer. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> it's guaranteed, isn't it? <laughs> and that's all for this week. Next time, we report on why the Hampshire Watercrest line now stretches all the way to the Argyle. In the meantime, I've looked through the tractor hire catalogue and found a tractor to suit my needs for the weekend. So I'm off now to tour the estate. <laughs> so we put John on the F-Plan high-fibre diet. And six months later, he's lost five stone, as I found out when I visited him at his shop in Newport on the Isle of Wight. <laughs> that bloke. What bloke, Constable? You know, the one that's going around upsetting children and annoying their parents. Come on, Mr. Wackaday, wackaday, wackaday. Ooh, cool. <laughs> Ouch. Perhaps one of the most memorable networked outside broadcasts transmitted from Southampton by TVS was the return to their home port in July 1982 of the Canberra and the QE2 after their important role in the Falklands campaign. The atmosphere, the crowds, and even the weather exceeded everyone's expectations. It was a day for pride, for patriotism, and perhaps, too, for contemplation about the madness and wickedness of war. Roll VT-63. And uh, one is filled with terrific admiration for the whole operation, but particularly for our own Royal Marines who are coming back today. Uh, when Canberra set sail on Good Friday, of course, one really did not think that the campaign would last anywhere near this length of time. Uh, as it's happened, it's, as it's turned out, it's been a very uh, bloody campaign and a very real one. And now, three months later, uh, it's really terrific to see, or nearly, to see the ship coming round uh, in alongside. Well, they can see her now at the international terminal as she comes along. And, of course, the whole of uh, Southampton's waterfront has been uh, up early this morning. They were queuing up at, uh, as early as 6 o'clock this morning. People had driven from all over the country, from the Midlands and elsewhere, slept in their cars, turned up and were just there, ready and waiting for the dock gates to open. This is the moment that they have all waited for and dreamed of. And it's the moment perhaps they didn't dare to dream of when they set sail.
extraordinary emotional scenes there, not a dry eye in the house, and for a very good reason. And now on to Meridian's Watch, which will continue long after this ugly but much-loved building has been pounded into dust. In the long lost days of the BBC's That's Life, Esther Ranson went from researcher to primetime presenter in what seemed like a flash and made her name and her reputation. More recently, with a modest change of title to That's Esther, she switched channels and from this studio launched ITV's leading social action series. Here she is, talking to Joan Collins about what else but sex. When I did my playback, a Playboy layout, I was 49 or 48, I can't remember, and I said, this is the last time anybody except my most intimate acquaintances will see me without my clothes on. Was it frightening? Was what frightening? Taking all your clothes off at 49 and... No, no, because I look pretty good. Yeah. And I had a wonderful <laughs> photographer <laughs> and lots of very good lighting. And the pictures were great. I mean, I really liked it. But it wasn't one of those Playboy, you know, layouts with everything hanging out. It was uh, discreetly covered up with um, bits of lace and black garter belts and all of that sort of thing. Is it very exposing to, to go over that sort of... Not really, because... You know, I've done nude scenes in movies, and um, there's only just the actor there and the uh, director and the uh, cameraman. And the so, and, a, and, a, and a large bottle of gin usually helps. <laughs> that'll, uh, that'll get your inhibitions down, as well as your pants. Um, <laughs> but you've so, got the technicians and you've got the dirty old men in raincoats in the <laughs> cinema. And I don't that even think about the dirty old men in raincoats. No, you can't think about things like that. You just have to think. It is actually one of the most unsexy things to do to do a love scene. They always say do. that. Do we believe them? No. Do they always. Oh well, I'm sorry, but it's absolutely true. And I've only done about you know two or three really kind of raunchy ones in the stud, and um, one with George Papard. And it's 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 so technical because there's always the thing of the nose getting in the way or the light being in the wrong place, and um, it's it's highly unerotic. I assure you. However, the final result usually looks quite good. Now, in your life, you've had some glamorous men in your time. Yes. Which was the best? Well, you know, Joan Rivers asked me this question once. Yeah. And she looked at me and she said, exactly what you're doing. Yeah. And she said, so, Joan, come on, tell me, who was the best man you've ever had? And I said, your husband. <laughs> Was in the break, she said, You and Edgar, you didn't. <laughs> I said, Of course, I didn't. He was far too old for me. <laughs> and I'm making no comment at all about that. Now, into its fourth series, our network programme, I Want That House, follows British punters as they search for their dream home overseas. The production team has crisscrossed the globe, and the shows have had audiences of two million and more. In a materialistic age, this is called lifestyle television. And, for those who can afford it, the chance to own a second house overseas, in Italy, for example, becomes a dream rather than the nightmare it might be for the rest of us. It's brilliant. <laughs> it's, a, it's a bargain. Yeah, it is an absolute bargain. €35,000 for all that. As it stands at the moment, we want to buy this house. I think we should speak to Anna no. now. <laughs> <laughs> Where did she <you> <laughs> <laughs> Do you know where she lives? Luciana has just told me mm -hmm. that she was talking to the woman before, and the woman says there is somebody else interested. Yeah. So if you, we're going to talk to her now, but if yeah. you really want it, you have to sign something. Okay, cool. So, <laughs> let's call her. Pronto, posso parlare con signore Ricci? Sì, grazie. Pronto, allora io mi chiamo Karen Roos, eh, sono la collega di Luciano Gargiullo, forse lei eh, ha chiamato prima, sì. Allora io... Sì, sì, lo so. Allora io sono qui a Gomberetto. Con... Va bene, grazie mille, arrivederci, arrivederci. Oh, so. It's fine, he says he will um, sign a purchase proposal. When? Uh, he's going to come to Banning to look tomorrow. And he's happy to wait for the money for a few days if... You haven't got a check with you. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> and let's hope they lived happily ever after. Well, now, I must spare Jill's blushes by introducing Country Ways for her. This wonderful series, now in its 21st year, and still put together from the studios here beside Southampton's River Itchen. 
Well, now, in this short piece, Jill is in the depths of darkest Dorset with one of those extraordinary people they find who still, thank heavens, thrive in the southern countryside. You come across places and people in Dorset that give you hope that the world has not gone completely mad. Retired quarryman Dickie Plummer is one of them. He lives at Silly Hill Cottage, which he hasn't found time to smarten up since coming here in 1961. He's always on the go, sweeping chimneys, clearing other people's houses, organising an annual traction engine rally, and collecting a million useful things in his yard. Charles Dickens, or Thomas Hardy, might have written about Dickie. What is wonderful is that he's here. The garden's very important to me because it gives me a great thrill to go out and dig potatoes or cut a cabbage, and you know what you're eating. The main thing is you must try to put more into the soil than what you expect to take out. And then don't forget that all seasons are beat good judgment. No matter how good a garden you are, old Mother Nature cats you out now and then. Come on, then. We keep goats over there, and the goat manure is the finest manure to bring any ground in really good condition. And you won't get better because they eat anything and they convert it to a good manure. And what the goats are waste, the chickens will pick up. You know, the two is good together, like. And uh, the goats get on well with them, but they don't like the cock bird. They pull his tail feathers out. We always kept chickens as, a, as children. Mother always kept a hen. It just don't seem right not to have chickens at all. Like, you know, we've always had them and, and we must have chickens and that's it. <laughs> this is my 1916 tractor come over for the First World War and we got a bit of a religious way to start it. First of all, we want to turn the handle to pump the oil in the engine. We set the impulse for a good spark on the mag and then we come round here to put the petrol in. In this little container here, that's all the petrol she you need. We put the choke on and we set the Mixture needle, and we're, we hope they're going to start. The sound of the old Titan is just music, and it gives me a thrill right down through my body. It's like a, the shivers running down, and uh, there's nothing like it. And I never seen one before I bought it in '58. I'm contented, I'm happy, I don't envy nobody. If you won the lottery tomorrow, I wouldn't be a bit jealous. I'd say, well, couldn't happen to a nicer man. But the thing is, there's so many people it's just grab, grab all the time, and they just, just walk over you, and that's, that's as far as it is, isn't it? There's nothing better than dear old Dorset. She's a lovely girl, but you must leave her alone. If you pull her about, you're going to spoil her. And what fun we have, out in the sticks with so many lovely people like Dickie. Meridian's arts programme, The Frame, crossed the Solent to ride on the Isle of Wight for an object lesson in the skill and dedication involved in filmmaking. Who better to listen to than the remarkable Anthony Minghella, who just finished work on his great success, The English Patient. His job makes what we're doing here seem like child's play. What you try to do, I think, is remember the time when you were dreaming the film. Remember that you're making only one tiny piece of it. You're making a little bit of the film every day. Each shot is the most important shot. And it's like making a huge jigsaw puzzle. You just concentrate on this one piece and know that this thing which looks entirely blue, perhaps, or entirely black and stony, is eventually going to find its way into somebody's iris. It's going to be this incredible gleam in somebody's eye. But today, it just looks like a tiny pebble. And you just polish and work it and polish and believe in it. And I try to approach every single moment in the movie, every frame, as being the key frame of the film. There is no other frame other than the one that I'm trying to, to find in that moment.
It was a long haul. The shoot for the English patient lasted four months in very difficult conditions. But in the end, the hard work paid off. The proudest parents in the world, as their son received the ultimate honor in Los Angeles, Gloria and Eddie Mingella were watching the ceremony live at home in Ride. Well we had a dream, Saul and I, of what this film could be, but now we've come out the other end, and it seems like, just as we'd hoped, there is a huge audience waiting for this film, and we're so thrilled and so blessed and honored. It was an emotional climax to four years' hard work for Anthony Minghella and his family. The English patient scooped nine out of the 12 Academy Awards it was nominated for. Well, you can't do better than that, and what a great creative talent that man has. And next to one of television's favourite women, Carol Vorderman, who, in 1999, presented a characteristically bold programme made by Meridian for ITV and sold around the world. It was called Tested to Destruction and examined the huge lengths companies go to in trying out their products. Nuclear protection suits, car tyres and airbags, toasters and here bulletproof glass for pop stars and politicians. Stopping a bullet from a gun like a 44 Magnum, the kind of gun that Clint Eastwood used in Dirty Harry, is an extremely difficult thing to do. Alan's loading one. Uh, one of these now. Now these bullets, Alan, will travel at what speed? Way over a thousand miles an hour. And safety obviously is very important here. Yes. It, why do I need these on? Uh, well, if you don't, you'll have a whistle for at least a week. No, well, I, okay. okay, I'll put them on. Alan, it? it does, yeah. It's just, oof, it's, uh, it's frightening. Something to experience. The glass stops it. Yes. And the final test: Can the bullet-resistant glass stop a one-ounce lead slug fired from a shotgun? Incredibly, yes, it can. And just as well, too, I should think, for the expensive camera behind the glass there, the cameraman, I'm assured, was taking cover. And now back to Dorset, that treasured county of Thomas Hardy, which doesn't immediately bring to mind the jungles of Africa or the rainforests of South America. Yet this is where you'll find the wonders of Monkey World, a rescue sanctuary for our two-footed friends. Now broadcasting in 150 countries, Meridian's monkey business is in its eighth series. A grown-up man's fostering of a baby chimpanzee is typical of this everyday story of monkey folk. One member of staff has other things to attend to first thing. Keeper Jeremy has a new house guest in the shape of a baby chimpanzee called Seamus. You hungry? Seamus was the first baby both conceived and born at the park in April last year. His mother became pregnant after her contraceptive failed. Sadly, she soon lost interest in little Seamus and the dedicated Jeremy has once again become a foster dad. It's a role which seems to quite suit him. He really is a good baby, Touchwood, because he's um, very self-contained. He doesn't want anything. He doesn't, you know, he's, he's just very sort of independent, if you like, which, although that's not terribly nice, you know, because it's nice to have a you know, a sort of coochie coo relationship with the baby, but in his favour, because of his situation, it can only be good for him, you know, for the future life of getting him back into, into, into being a chimpanzee rather than living at home here with me. When eight-year-old Cherry gave birth to Seamus, she tried her best to be a mum, but never quite got the hang of it. His mum was one of the ones who took the contraceptive implant out. Basically, she's only a young girl. I mean, she's like the equivalent of a 15-year-old human sort of thing. And um, although she nursed him, she actually nursed him for two or three weeks. And then um, she got bored. And, of course, she, 
wanted to go and play with her friends, like teenage girls do. I'm start that. And so, um, you know, she'd, she'd just put him down in the wood wall, in the, in the bedding, and, and go and play with her friends. And, of course, you, you can't do that. Poor old Seamus, but obviously in very good hands there. Anyway, once one of the walled and jealously guarded aristocratic estates of England, Goodwood now opens its gateways to the great unwashed, with horse racing and golf, stately home tours and banquets, and, of course, its popular Festival of Speed, which attracts more spectators than the British Grand Prix at Silverstone. Here, beside the South Downs at Chichester, is an annual celebration of everything a car enthusiast could possibly desire. Oh, and some surprises as well. Now, most cars at the festival come up the hill, but the first law of gravity is what goes up must come down, and these boys take that theory to a new level. This is the Soapbox Challenge. These cars have no engines in them, the maximum weight is 135 kilos, and they only have very rudimentary brakes. Now, the really quick guys will get to the bottom of the hill in just over a minute, maxing out at about 60 miles an hour. catching entries is ecclesiastical racing. Anthony and Keith here are both vicars and they're taking part in the downhill challenge. Why is the first question obviously? Well we saw the carts running last year and we thought this actually would be quite a good way for raising what we uh, are doing with Revelation Racing and that's basically being who we are which is uh, ministers in the Church of England but also coming out and doing normal things. We, you know doing things everyday people do. Saying like that go down the hill at Goodwill, yeah, everybody, yeah, everybody does that all the time. No, no. We're, we're normal, we have the same passion. You think this same... is normal? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's normal to have a passion about motorsport, isn't it? Right, of course And that's one is. thing we share, isn't it? Of course it is. Well, you're up against some mm. pretty serious works outfits here. I've seen uh, Bentley entry, mm. Vauxhall, mm. Lotus thing. Mm. Looks like it spent a lifetime in the wind tunnel. What's it like being a privateer against the big guns? Well, in some ways, we think of ourselves as the works entry, um, representing who we do. and. Uh, it's all part of enjoying ourselves and, and they've accepted us and, and we've accepted them so we'll, we'll do our best and we'll hope to, to scare them a bit with our speed. So we thought long and hard about certain aspects of the design. I worried for a while about how to make the steering work with no steering column but in true biblical fashion it came to me in a dream. Really? It did, it honestly did and, and I put it together and it worked. Well, Although I let Keith drive it. <laughs> I have to say, though, without wishing to be rude, aerodynamically, this thing, compared to some of the others, does look a bit like a Model T Ford yes. compared to an F1 mm. racer. But mm. what sort of maximum speed are you going to hit? Towards 50, yeah. over the mid-40s. Really? Yes. Well, very best of luck. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Oh dear, but I'm told that it was all okay. Courageous guys, those, in every way. Now, there may just be a touch of anarchy about this thought, but there is perhaps something appropriate about the fact that the last big show to come out of Studio One here in Southampton was Dennis Norden with It'll Be All Right on the Night. After all, you couldn't have a much larger blooper than the whole building being smashed to smithereens. So on this old television soundstage, where so many great actors, stars and entertainers have strutted their stuff, raised a laugh or tempted a tear. The final curtain is lifted to a Southampton audience, the last of thousands through these doors, to enjoy the gaffes and embarrassments of our industry. Better by far, though, to make our exit with a smile rather than with a cry or a whimper. And when all is said and done, entertainment and the chance to forget your troubles for a few minutes is probably more precious than all the solemn speeches ever made. And even the grimmest psychiatrists seem to agree that laughter sometimes is the best medicine. Well, it's difficult to know how to end such an extravaganza of nostalgia as this without becoming too sentimental. Absolutely. Perhaps it closes some sort of a tidy circle, if you like, to finish off with one of the songs with which Southern Television closed down on New Year's Eve 1981 after 24 years at the helm. 
Yes, the singer is Lillian Watson, accompanied by the Bournemouth Sinfonietta. Well, as they say so often in our business, that's all we've got time for. And it really has been just the tip of the iceberg. It is, after all, nearly 50 years of broadcast television that we're talking about. The good, the bad, the ugly and the beautiful. <laughs> and as this strange old building tumbles down and new Riverside Apartments take its place, spare a thought if you're passing for the gentle ghosts that will linger here for the dreams that have been created over the decades and for the pleasure that we hope has been given to millions of people. Goodbye Bye for, for now. now. Oh, and by the way, we're just off up the road now to Fairham to start trying to create another half-century of dreams and memories for you to enjoy. Oh.